Thank you very much for including my office today. And uh, I'm one of 18 staff that work for the city's Office of Emergency Management. And not to be rude, but I have my cell phone, uh, which is part and parcel of the job that I do. Our office is on call 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, and we rotate on a weekly basis. And it just so happens that this was my week. So if my phone rings, I'll have to excuse myself for a period of time to deal with the circumstances that are on the other end of the phone. So the Office of Emergency Management is um, legally mandated uh, by the provincial government um, to uh, put together a response structure and organization that deals with all city uh, emergencies. We run an emergency operations center uh, central in Toronto um, that is available to be activated at a moment's notice and that would happen through a situation where I would be called as the on-call person for that period of time and then I would mobilize the, op the activation of the emergency operations center. Um, in that it, we have the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act that's a piece of provincial legislation that empowers us to operate under these circumstances and then in a provincial piece of legislation uh, the municipal code chapter 59 um, has the senior management structure that's run through the mayor's office and a program called temp c the toronto emergency management uh, planning committee um, to oversee all major um, responses now um, i will skip uh, couple slides to go to say that so 365 days a year um, today would be an average day it would be a level zero if there were a couple of fires in the city that were unrelated it would still be a level zero a level one would be if there's something suspicious going on in our environment that has to have a heightened sense of awareness we would put up a level one and take these steps to be able to respond even quicker than um, a day-to-day -day normal event. A level three would be something that happened like the ice storm. The ice storm was clearly a level three. Our emergency operations center was activated and all relevant city departments were activated in responding to the um, issues of the ice storm. Okay, so that's the, the general framework for the uh, Office of Emergency Management in our Emergency Operations Center. Now, if I could get the second presentation up. Oh, and so as recently as Thursday of this week, I was in a session with the emergency management team from Fort McMurray. And are we all familiar with the circumstances of Fort McMurray? And they said regardless of the response that they implemented with had, which had uh, uh, responders from other municipal jurisdictions, provincial jurisdictions, and federal jurisdictions, they said the single most important thing that came out of that event was the necessity to have a personal preparedness kit. Okay, so you each have a, a fridge magnet there as a uh, reminder of the things that you can do to prepare your personal preparedness kit. And if you're so inclined, and I'll go through this in, in, a, in a moment or two, if you're so inclined, um, it's also important to have a mobile kit, so if you ever have to evacuate, you would be in the position of having these necessities with you at the time of evacuation. So we're just going through, um, how do I get this to go back? Yeah. Well, okay, so um, this is a history of emergency response throughout the course of the history of Toronto and an, an evolution of the services that we provide. So we're at 1841 now, so while I was talking we skipped a few years. And that's St. Lawrence Hall. And here we have the first water supply, that's Spadina Avenue. You see the University of Toronto building at the top there. And we had our horse-drawn ferries in 1845. And our first 
professional fire service from 1874. Our first fire hydrant system, that again is on Spadina. And street lights in 1879, again on Spadina. Toronto Hydro, 1884. Railway, and we still haven't landed on a mass transportation plan that everybody agrees to. <laughs> <laughs> and an incinerator that's still there at uh, Eastern Avenue in the Lakeshore. And our a water main break in uh, 1893. Public testing of water um, in 1896. It's just general, we had wireless in 1901, Marconi. He was not Canadian. The Wright brothers' first flight in 1903. And then a tremendous fire in 1904. And you'll see in the next slide, or the, the subsequent slide. This is all in the downtown core along Bay Street, and it really wiped out much of the building. So you see Old City Hall at the top in that gap there. So that was quite a devastating uh, situation. The Nielsen Building that's on King Street that collapsed under construction. Our water tunnel program and chlorinating the water in 1910. Our first, our first plane crash. Nobody died. Now think about this. In um, 1913, in a storm on Lake Ontario and Lake Huron, 240 sailors died. Fishing was a predominant industry, or 270 sailors died. Fishing was a predominant industry, and it's tough for me to imagine 270 sailors dying on Lake Ontario. It's uh, quite something. That's the University of Toronto, soldiers uh, mustering for the First World War, which is when the Canadian Red Cross started its services in Toronto, and we heavily rely upon them till today. The ferry crash in 1915 in Scarborough. Now, Toronto had the lowest rate of major city cholera um, deaths in 1913, but that was quite an epidemic sweeping North America. We started using airlines for trans uh, postal transmissions. The Don River, this is a view from the brickworks, flooding long before the Don Valley Parkway. And look at these fine young men playing on the streets of Toronto. One of those hats. And the Eastern Avenue Bridge collapsed over the dawn. That bridge is still there. The covered portion is not. But that bridge is still there. It's not used today. And our coldest day, minus 45 degrees in 1933. And the lake totally froze over in 1934. Now look at those scandalous outfits. Just, <laughs> but 1,200 people died in a heat wave in the city of Toronto um, because of lack of ventilation and overheating. And thank goodness we don't face those situations today. We do have heat waves, but uh, the impact is far less. Pearson International Airport opening, 1938. Second World War. That was not in Canada. Our heaviest snowfall in um, 1944, close to 50 centimeters. 
1999, when we called in the army, we had uh, less than 18 centimeters. <laughs> now, another tragic fire, tragic fire in the, the 40s, where 140 people died at the foot of Young Street in on Lake Ontario. And it, the boat did have fire suppression systems, but they were not connected. Would anybody here have remembered that? CB, uh, CBC starting its broadcast in 1952. Now Hurricane Hazel, so this is in um, the Lampton area in, in Etobicoke, the wiping out of a whole neighborhood because we used to build in floodplains and uh, city planning now prevents that there's a mitigation strategy, you can't build in some areas as a result of uh, Hurricane Hazel. Those are five firefighters that died during the response because they got swept away, not their vehicle. There's still the monuments there along the Humber, which caused the Toronto Regional Conversation, uh, Conservation Authority to be opened in 1957. The office I worked for, or worked for, it opened in 1960. Just contextually, allegedly, the first man on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, I have no recollection of this, although I was, <laughs> I was alive and well in there. A hundred people died at Pearson International Airport. Um, people remember that? Yes. Yeah. Brampton. Yeah. Skip my consciousness. Opening of the, uh, the shipyard down at the western part of Toronto. Our first satellite, another scandalous outfit, you see that? 1972. Pickering, 1973. Let's see the tower. Does anybody have one of those? <laughs> and what could it do? Now that's the Mississauga train derailment. Those are those dot 111 cars. 250,000 people were evacuated. And our worst terrorism event, the Air India flight, where that bomb was put on at Pearson International Airport. 300 people died. deadliest uh, terrorist event prior to 9-11, where 24 Canadians died. And then at the air show, not that long ago, 1996, seven, uh, pot, uh, seven air crew died out in Lake Ontario. Sorry it's taken so long. And then we had several ice storms, so 1998, the one that really affected Quebec, a lot of hydro towers went down. And that was our <laughs> the military, the whopping 18 centimeters of snow. <laughs> now, in eastern Toronto, you have Chemical Court. There was the Hickson Fire. Um, these were built along the lake so that prevailing winds would take that affluent over the lake and not affect citizens. But it's a real issue. And there are communication towers there that put out sirens that um, tell people to take shelter. Sometimes evacuating is not the first course of action. So that's just the tragedy of 9-11. The SARS was a huge event. My office was open during the SARS to, to get the people who know what is going on make the appropriate decision and uh, protect public safety, as we were in the uh, blackout in 2003. That was a crash at Pearson International. Uh, amazingly, nobody was killed. And now we have more severe weather, and that weather, because of paving, 
because of uh, intensification in our city core causes a lot more damage. So here, Finch Avenue was totally washed out and took six months to uh, rebuild. Sunrise Propane, urban intensification, builds around formerly industrial areas. 15,000 families were relocated. The uh, gas attendant was, was killed in that explosion. And the G20 summit, that was uh, a big three weeks for my office. <laughs> and uh, Chief Pegg sent a lot of crews, the Hussar crews, which is a regional uh, response, heavy urban search and rescue to Algo Mall, and the Don Valley flooding. Now, the city's taking steps to open the mouth of the Don Valley, and then of course the ice storm in 2013, which really leads into my presentation today to answer the question, what does the emergency management office do? So you see the costs of the city were $86 million, 800,000 people were uh, without power. <laughs> So, you know, the reason why I think it's a legitimate question, and uh, I think uh, the question was asked me prior to presentation today, why don't we have pre-established response areas that we would activate um, if in an emergency situation in the city? Is it the batteries, or? And, and the reason is, we look at emergencies, they can happen in an all-hazards approach at any time, at any place across the city. So the city does have emergency response structures in place that we immediately activate, as you saw um, with Chief Pegg. Can you advance it? And, um, yeah, okay. Okay, so the city has an emergency plan. All the city departments um, have a coordinated role. That's a picture in our emergency operations center. And we implement our emergency plan on an as-needed basis. And so, okay, now skip that slide, go to 94 if you can. Okay, so the ice storm of 2013 could be any event. It could be a factory fire, it could be a railway disaster, the city, operates its emergency plan. In the ice storm, we operated 10 um, reception centers at 10 different locations across the city where we provided sleeping arrangements, food, um, human, uh, the necessities of, of daily living at all these locations. You know, in addition to that, we activated uh, 13 police stations that could be used as warming centers. Now, if you take the ice storm component out of this, if there was a train derailment that caused the evacuation of a particular neighborhood in the city of Toronto, we would implement that same type of plan. Uh, next slide, please. In, at that reception center, we would obviously provide a safe place for people to stay. We would register people so we would know who they are, we would know where they live, and we would also be able to do family reunifications of evacuated people. People would be fed, people would be supervised 24 hours a day, people would be able to recharge their cell phones, people would be able to access their, their hygiene uh, requirements. We have um, a relationship with the Canadian Red Cross where the staff of these facilities would be uh, a hybrid of city staff and volunteer staff that would address the needs of the displaced public. <coughs> Next slide. At the ice storm, we housed up to 3,100 people uh, in overnight uh, facilities. We served over 18,000 meals, distributed 2,000 hygiene kits. And again, that was for the ice storm, but this could happen in any situation. Next slide. And those would be the police station warming centers. Next slide. So what my office does is we do the emergency social service response. So if this building was evacuated, the, the building is licensed on, a, on an 
an annual basis. It has an evacuation strategy. It would implement its evacuation strategy, but they would say, if, and they have reciprocal agreements with like facilities to, to put the most needy people, um, but if there were the need to house uh, large numbers of other people, the city would op open reception centers. So next slide, and then next slide, and then the following slide. So what we've done is we have evaluated all city assets across the city. If we situate this area on the map, it would be in the left, upper left part of the screen here, right where that cursor is, right around there. The fire department would put the boundaries to say you, you cannot locate the reception center within this, uh, let's say, three square kilometers to where this derailment has taken place. We would look at what city assets are most appropriate and relevant to operate a reception center, and we would locate people there. So the people would be evacuated, police, fire, and EMS, and all platforms of, of uh, mass media would, would uh, message to people to go to the Swansea Town Hall, or to go to the Keel Community Center, or the Annette Community Center, and that's where the reception center would be. So people would be evacuated to those locations. City staff and our uh, contracted staff from the Red Cross and Salvation Army would set up reception centers in that location. Next slide. So it's uh, critical that we have those partners. Next slide. And it's important that uh, we all uh, practice the, the necessity of personal preparedness. Next slide. So, to know your risks, and, and we're talking about rail safety right now, rail safety is really relevant in this community, so what are the plans that, that people have to take in place in order to uh, mitigate the, the uh, reality of living close to a railway plan? It's important that you go through those 72 hour preparedness messages that you have there. And the city has our website at Toronto, www.toronto.ca forward slash OEM. And um, those guides, you have preparedness guides on your tables. All those guides are available on our website as well. And it's important to take the time to make your personal preparedness kit. Next slide. Now, the city also does a hazard risk identification process. We do it on a regular basis, every three years or so, and we look at what the most likely events happen in the city of Toronto. Next slide. And we look at, these are um, the top six issues that we would experience. Following slide. Now, this, uh, by a show of hands, how many people actually have a 72-hour personal preparedness kit? <laughs> okay, well, well, we got, so we have one and a half. <laughs> one and a half. Now, you know what, uh, can you go down a few slides? Go down, a, uh, I can't really, click that one. Okay, next slide after that. Okay, so, the top 10 things you do can do, okay, is to uh, dedicate a space in your living environment, okay? And every person needs at least four liters of water per day, right? To do, in order to do that, we would recommend that should you ever um, have empty two liter pop bottles. It's not something that you have immediately, but over the course of time. If you have a two liter pop bottle, you rinse it out thoroughly, maybe drop a, ble uh, drop a bleach or two in that bottle, rinse it out thoroughly, fill up that bottle, tighten the cap down tightly, put it under your bed, okay? Two bottles, that's one day's supply per person. So over the course of time, you have a water supply. Now, it's, it's difficult, how many really struggled in that power failure, right? Well, only one of you really struggled in that power failure? I'm thinking several people struggled in that power failure. Did you have a water supply on your own? Right? Yeah. Now, the, the other thing is, 
when you're in that situation and you don't have access to information and you don't know what's going on, that really amps up your anxiety. So we recommend that you have a battery-powered radio, and now we have crank-powered radios where a minute of cranking can last up to 10 minutes of information. So you don't have to do it continually so you get a blow-by-blow, blow, but you can crank up that radio every half hour or so to get regular updates from the media as to the situation of um, the, the, the power outage. Now it's important to have a food supply. The food supply that you would need is non-perishable foods, canned foods. If you have canned foods, you need a can opener, right? You would have dry goods like nuts and cookies and, and uh, things like that that can store over a period of time. And those kits should really reflect your family makeup. If you have infants, pets, or, or seniors, we all have uh, different needs. So to accommodate those needs in your uh, kit. A first aid kit, hand sanitizer, have your drugs, uh, your prescription drugs. When you refill your prescriptions, it's important to keep the, the, um, the receipt that you get with those prescriptions. If you put it in your personal preparedness kit, then you'll at least have a list of active medications that you need. So if those medications have to be replaced, if you don't have access to your um, supply of medications, you can fill them more easily than saying I have to get in touch with my doctor. In those um, brochures, you also have the in case of emergency information sheet. If you fill out that sheet and you put it in the place you'll find, I recommend inside your fridge or taped onto your fridge or inside your freezer. You'll always know that where your freezer is and you'll always know that that information sheet is there as opposed to in a, in a vague place that you might not be able to remember. Um, next slide. Now it's important that um, when you're in, in a situation where you have no heat to uh, have your head covered and your ankles and your wrists covered. Those are the areas that you uh, lose most of your heat from and it makes um, uh, the, the, the time not as uh, arduous as if you haven't taken these um, precautions. How many of you have generators? How many of you would require a generator, sir? There is one in the building. In, the, in this building? Which well, is good. run every Monday morning. No, that's good, yeah, to keep the uh, um, fuel fresh. Excellent. Okay, and that's basically the personal preparedness message and what the Office of Emergency Management does and how it would respond on an individual basis to all emergencies and locate a reception center as close to the event as possible that's relevant to the community that's affected. Okay. That's it. Any questions? A question there. Questions? Uh, yes. Uh, during, during the Second World War in Toronto, uh, we had several air raid warning uh, practices. Um, are sirens used in Toronto? Will there be sirens or because... Okay, so the question is, in the Second World War, we had air raid sirens in the city and they were practicing. It's a, you know, it's a different society today. Some of those sirens still exist. Um, they're not maintained or regulated by everybody, uh, by anybody. Occasionally, one of those sirens will sporadically go off, causing hysteria. And Young and Eglinton <laughs> seems to be an area where there's still an active siren. But nobody that I know of is claiming responsibility from those sirens. Not the federal government, provincial government, municipal government. No, number one. Number two, there is one series of sirens in Toronto, and that's in that chemical court area in eastern Scarborough, and citizens around that uh, affected zone get literature in their mailboxes on an annual basis that say, should you hear these sirens, take cover, shelter in place. And shelter in place means you turn off your air conditioning, you close your windows, and you stay inside until you get information that it's safe to leave. Okay? Immediately evacuating is not necessarily the best practice to take. But, but that thing about the, the air raids does come up on a, on a frequent basis. And so I say our society is different. 
Now, I, I don't know, from a counselor perspective, how easy would it be to put in sirens in people's neighborhoods? People would say, I don't want us to look at this thing, or this is going to affect my property value. This is a big issue that happened in Pickering with respect to the nuclear power plant. People didn't want to see sirens. The fact that it could really save your life was irrelevant to the fact that they didn't want to look at these ugly structures. Like, what does the siren look like? It would be a tall pole with a, you know, a, a, a large bell horn type speaker in four directions that uh, people would have to look at. Sir? Uh, I understand a lot of this um, iodine protects people from radioactivity, um, thyroid cancer in right. the case of radioactivity. And I understand that the circle in Pickering has just been, been forced to make it larger, a circle of people that are entitled to uh, iodine. Mm -hmm. How about increasing that to include Scarborough, which is also no, absolutely. vulnerable? Sorry, one of my portfolios prior to now was um, the nuclear file for, for the city of Toronto. And um, so there, there are uh, safety zones built. There's a three kilometer safety zone and a 10 kilometer safety zone. The 10 kilometer safety zone goes to Morningside Avenue, and there are potassium iodide tablets distributed throughout that whole zone to protect that public. Now, that zone has been increased to 20 kilometers, right? Which isn't a magic, uh, nothing's going to magically happen at 3 kilometers, 10 kilometers, or 20 kilometers. Now, I hate to break it to this crowd, but those potassium iodide pills are irrelevant to people over the age of 40. Okay? And just as a citizen, right, when you read about these potassium iodide pills, they aren't, if you take a potassium iodide pill, it isn't this magic umbrella that shields you from all adverse effects of nuclear radiation. The potassium iodide pill only, it, it saturates your thyroid gland and it prevents your thyroid gland from picking up the new iodide uh, isotope that would have been released in this nuclear emergency. So it would postpone the evolution of getting thyroid cancer. And then from a cost health perspective, it's cheaper to provide these tablets to the general public than deal with the thyroid cancer that may emerge in the general public years up to 30 years after the event. So it's not this magic uh, cure to the effects of a nuclear explosion, and those pills aren't relevant to people over the age of 40. Sugar um, I'd like to start by thanking everyone. I've learned a lot of life. Um I have a question that I think might be best suited for Mr. Gormick, but uh, anyone who knows about it, please answer. Um, I've read that the national safety inspection budget has diminished substantially in recent years. Um, has technology allowed for less human supervision, or is this adding to our risk uh, with the amount of trains transporting hazardous goods increasing? If not, uh, what can we do to motivate the federal government to be more proactive as opposed to reactive? Being short. Um, I'm glad you raised that because I deal with people at the National Transportation Safety Board regularly and they're good folks. They're hideously overworked and they do have an arm's length relationship. You'll see, especially recently, um, the NTSB has been pushing things on its own. Positive train control is one of the things they keep coming back to. Um, and, you know, I mentioned, I think I, I was talking to someone about these incident reports that I see. Um, and that's something that concerns me. Because I'm not supposed to see them, which that should raise a question. Like, <laughs> why can't we see these incident reports under this safety management system, which is basically saying to the railways, we trust you to run your own safety system. Now, if there's a problem, we're going to be a little concerned. But um, the NTSB is flooded with these incident reports. And they have a hard enough time dealing with all of this. They've got their major investigations. So yeah, this is something that we do need to speak with the federal government about because where resources are going to be focused, 
that would be one of the places that I would suggest. We need to have that independent authority that has the resources to do the right thing. And as far as I can see from recent dealings with them, I caught something. Uh, there was a near miss between a VIA train and a GO train uh, down near the Botanical Gardens in Hamilton on the Labor Day weekend. The only reason I knew about it was because somebody slipped me the incident report and I took that to the NTSB, which they welcomed. And they told me, well, you have the right to ask for a preliminary public investigation. I said, great, I'm asking for that. What if I hadn't brought this to you? They said it would have just gone through the system. So yes, the NTSB is a very important component of this. They need greater resources. They need to have more inspectors, qualified inspectors, independent inspectors who can handle this. Preparedness to me, that's why as soon as I see the incident reports, I think, there's preparedness. If I'm seeing trends in these incident reports, which we don't all get to see, that's telling me something. And it's the NTSB that should be, I won't say empowered, but should have, have the resources to bring a greater focus to that. Okay, so I think what we're going to do is take one more question and then move on to Sheila Murray from Crew, and then get back to a couple questions there. And, and <coughs> Boris will be here for the duration of the workshop, and so will Greg. Not sure about everyone else, but there, if you have questions um, for Craig or Boris, they're they're happy to answer questions after when the workshop piece begins as well. But I think there's one more here. I wanted to ask Boris in a retirement home setting, uh, we're required to keep emergency supplies on hand. Um, would it be recommended that uh, if individual residents uh, have some sort of a kit? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Um, independent information where you can get information from news sources um, reduces reduces anxiety absolutely um, not having to be dependent on food and water supply from an external provider reduces uh, anxiety and makes it uh, more manageable if you go to our website again toronto.ca forward slash oem um, all the information is there as to how to, to build a kit um, so from from my knowledge because sometimes we make the, the erroneous assumption do most people have access to the internet and that information? By show of hands? Yeah, so, yeah, so there's good saturation there. Well, no, 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 no. Preparedness doesn't happen at the time of the event. <laughs> you prepare long before the event happens. If the electricity is not, the electrical source is not there, then the, all the dependence on the internet is goes out the window because it Correct. goes off. Correct. That's why you need the crank radio, so you have access to that's the right. information. Yep. No one that's coming back. Yes, ma'am. Well, could we have handouts for those of us who aren't internet-wise? Yes, and I, I did bring, um, we have a, um, a, a pamphlet that's on each table, and I did bring some with me, but unfortunately, the only, the only language I do not have is English. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we print tens of thousands of these copies, and English goes out the first, um, and we just have to keep printing more. So I will be, we, my office will be getting uh, its next publication before the end of the year, and if you want, I guarantee you I can drop off as many as you need, but by me making those promises always results that we don't have any at the end of the year. Um, so we yeah, we, we do actually have a, a copy from who was generously donated by, by crew and, and uh, Rita Bichon from, from Green 13 as well. So each person does have a copy. They're not all the low rise. Some of them are the, the high rise versions, but um, we were able to scramble and get some. Um, so I hope that everyone does have a copy of their spot um, as well. Um, I think that's it. Yes. Um, thank you, Boris. That was excellent. Uh, next up is uh, she Sheila Murray. She's the project lead for uh, community resilience to extreme weather. It's uh, the crew is short form. Uh, Sheila provide will provide us with an update on crew's work in helping communities um, to become prepared in the event of, a, of um, an extreme weather event. 
but um, as we've, we've learned, um, we need to prepare it, be prepared for all kinds of emergencies. So I know what she has to say will be very helpful to you. Thanks very much, and thanks for including the crew in this, um, in this afternoon of, of presentations and workshop. Um, you know, we, we're a tiny little um, uh, organization, uh, entirely volunteer-driven, um, and we base uh, our thinking on what Boris has just very recently said, which is um, it, the time to cope with an emergency is not when uh, the emergency is in process, it's beforehand. And, um, and so I'm not going to talk at all about rail, um, but I'm going to talk about um, neighborhood connections, about strong communities, and about, um, pre again, preparing ourselves. Crew has two conversations. One is um, around uh, weather projections, and um, I'll talk a bit more about heat, uh, and also individual preparedness and, and, uh, and, being, and helping your neighborhood be prepared through connections. So um, th th this is a little bit, I'm going to talk about our work. I'm going to talk about a game we play called Resilientville, which is really fun and, uh, and very informative. Um, Clarion, which is a community, about community resilience hubs. And this is a collaborative of um, different groups, including CREW, um, which wants to um, see multi-sector collaboration on, co on um, community resilience, but from the ground, led from the ground up with, with um, uh, collaboration from all sorts of other uh, stakeholders. Um, we have an extreme vol weather volunteer program, which may interest some of you, and I'll talk briefly about that. And then we've been piloting in Ward 13, largely because of Councillor Doucette's um, great support and uh, Green 13, who've done so much terrific work. Rita Bijon is a co-founder of CREW. Um, and we've, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about work we've done in Ward 13 and introduce our story map, which we're very proud of. So, um, just for a little bit of context, you know, communities, um, lots of you in this room are very community minded, so you, you know what um, neighborhood connections are and how valuable they can be. But I just wanted to show this, which is that. 38% of Canadians um, don't feel that they have any real sense of belonging in their local community. And one in five older Canadians and this incredible number of 64% of um, post-secondary students are um, lonely and, uh, and, and obviously very anxious about how they fit into their community. So that's for context. So there's a lot of work we can do um, to strengthen neighborhood connections. Um, crew talks about the weather. I was interested, Boris was talking about 44 degree heat earlier. I think 45 maybe. Um, that's what's projected for Toronto. 44 degrees is what we're looking at in, in, a, in we're not, we don't really know how many years because uh, as we all know, things are getting warmer rather faster than, than anybody had anticipated perhaps. So um, 44 degree heat, uh, 66 days over 30 extended heat waves. Um, I think that we do have to be really concerned about the weather, but I'm not going to spend too much. No. Well, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about heat. Um, but the big deal here is that we um, are our neighbors' best first responders when things start to go wrong. And Boris talked about how important it is that each of us is prepared, but also helping our neighbors to be prepared. It really matters. We're partners. We think of we should think of ourselves as partners with the city uh, in emergency response. And that doesn't mean you need to know stuff like CPR or you know have uh, be able to operate chainsaws or anything. But there will some you know among us there will be someone who knows something about all of these things. What it really means is that we check on each other um, and, and make sure uh, each of us is okay. So. The, the sort of the the, uh, the the literature definition for resilience, community resilience, is the ability of a community to um, respond, withstand, and uh, recover from adversity. Um, you know, who thinks of it as a process? Um, a process that 
that ideally is focused particularly on inequities among uh, vulnerable and marginalized groups. So we worry about the people who are least able to look after themselves. Um, and that's all of us paying attention to where those people are and what it is they might need when emergencies happen. Um, and um, and it's, resilience is also a process that strengthens those social ties, which I've already mentioned a number of times. Um, so when something happens, um, this response is robust. It comes out of the community. When, when first responders arrive in a community, the community is already sort of self-organized. Again, it's not about special knowledge, but it's about connecting all of the groups that Councillor Deset referred to earlier in a community together, groups, individuals, uh, and, and businesses, and so on and so forth, um, so that we all can have a relationship that is a, a, that can make a healthy response. Um, and this is about uh, Boris was saying, you know, you don't the time to uh, the time to worry about how what to do in an emergency is not in the emergency. It's um, it's about making these relationships before the emergency happens. So. You know, the people who say you don't, you don't hand out your business card in the emergency, you need to, to have had it uh, on hand before, before the emergency comes. So again, simply about making neighborhood connections. Um, it's about the levels of trust in the neighborhood, the social networks, and, um, and civic engagement because um, the more connected, the more organized, the more the, the civic engagement. Um, social capital. What's that? That's us. Um, and I'm and I just very quickly going to talk about the Chicago heat wave, which was 1995. It's a long time ago, um, but it's, it's far from irrelevant. Um, um, in 2003, 70,000 people died from heat uh, in Western Europe, and another 55,000 people died in Eastern Europe. These are not places that were without, uh, the sort of generally without um, resources, but uh, those deaths happened um, uh, in large part because heat is a silent killer, and, and when uh, nobody is there to check on somebody who is overheating, they can die silently. Uh, and uh, it's something we don't talk about a lot because it doesn't, it's not drama, it's not high drama except in the numbers. Um, so this is a much studied event, the Chicago heat wave, where what is it, 739 people died, seven times as many people as in Superstorm Sandy. Um, many people who died were in uh, poor neighborhoods, um, but two of those poorest neighborhoods, very poorest neighborhoods, had the least number of deaths. Um, why was that? It's very simply about the strong neighborhood connections in those, in those neighborhoods. Um, in those, the greatest number of deaths, those communities, these Afro-American communities, which are referred to here, I think, specifically because in Chicago, they were largely abandoned communities. These are places where there's lots of empty buildings and people have, there's a sort of, you know, there's no, very little social co cohesion at all. Um, and it's not so much that more Afro-Americans died, a lot of uh, elderly white folk died as well. Um, but this is sort of where the, where the studies have been. In the, in the two least uh, rate, rates, lowest rates of death, um, it was because people knew each other and because they had strong social connections. And if we go a little further down the slide, they have busy sidewalks, great community groups, and, uh, and, uh, and people looked out for each other. Um, it, among the Latinos, 25% uh, of the population in Chicago turns out is, uh, is Latino and it's very poor. Um, they had 2%, two, only 2% of them were um, uh, part of this sort of the, the deaths. Um, and that's because um, the, the levels of communication and interaction that they have is at the bottom of the slide it says the rough equivalent of a working air conditioner in every room. So social capital, social infrastructure, that's again, how connected are we? Um, some of some people call it sort of informal insurance. So uh, you know, it's it's all of us. It's all the people we know. It's people we would like to meet. Sometimes it's people we don't like very much, but we need to include them as well. It's always uh, uh, specially focused again on on people who are more marginalized. Um, and and the infrastructure is simply the ways in which we know each other. Um, 
So Crew uh, has done a number of things. Um, Clarion, community-led action for resilience in our neighborhoods, is um, a, a sort of collaborative group that came together at the end of the summer. OEM was part of this. Um, between us, we managed a um, uh, to, to stage a game-playing exercise called Resilient Build. We've done a number of Resilient Build games in different situations since then. Um, there are actually two games. Um, one is a role-playing game, the image at the top, and the other is an asset mapping game. They're really um, interesting things to do in community and very productive. Um, so the, the first one, that was Clarion's first outing, um, was this Resilient Doll workshop. Um, actually, at the Royal York, we managed to do a pretty significant workshop with um, zero, absolutely zero dollars. Um, and we asked lots of the wonderful people in the room, we asked them to take off their professional hats, please, and put on community hats and think about how they would come together to help um, in, in a times of extreme stress, help their neighbors. Um, same thing down below with the asset mapping. This is, a, this, this is a game where you take a very close look at a, a very defined local area, look at everybody in the neighborhood, and then say, what role could they play? But more particularly, more importantly, how do we get them to talk to each other and think about what might be coming and how we'll respond? That's the tough part. Um, we developed a program in 2015 with um, seniors, actually, out in Victoria Village, who um, half of whom lived in, um, live in a Toronto Community Housing Building, a really great group of people. And, uh, and the other half were in uh, low-income high-rises sort of nearby. And, and, many, and half of them were Chinese-speaking, by the way. Um, and, we, and what we asked them was to tell us what they needed in response to questions like, how can you help your neighbor? It's what comes naturally. But again, a little bit of planning, a little bit of forethought can generate um, materials like this. So for those who sort of signed up and said, yeah, I want to, I want to know more about this, um, we, uh, we gave, they gave themselves a name, which was the Extreme Weather Volunteers. Lots of talk about how they wanted to sort of frame that, but that's what they came up with. Um, uh, a flyer that they could hand to neighbors to sort of begin this conversation about weather and emergency preparedness. There are two um, sort of pieces of the most significant messaging on this that they came up with is neighbors helping neighbors. That's what this is all about. And do you want us to check on you in an emergency? And, and we dare you to say no. Um, and if you say no, then we know that you are in particular need of being checked on in an emergency because you may not be quite quite right. Um, and so they also asked to have, we've talked about Boris, this is the emergency plan, emergency kit and go bag that Boris was talking about in very simple form. It's the same stuff, but they said we want to see it all on one page. Um, I think we could do more work with this sort of interior of the flyer, but it's uh, it's essentially the same the same business and it's so important and as we've just seen how many people have them? 0.1% of people in the city, but this is critical stuff when something happens, and I, you may remember, and I do, from you know, Fort McMurray, from uh, other situations where people say, I had to evacuate and I had to make a decision about what to take with me, and really it was too late to be making that kind of decision. You actually had to go. So if you've worked your way through this stuff, you'll have something you can take with you immediately, copies of your important documents, I mean, in, in a little bag, simple things. I'm not going to spend too much time on that because there are lists here, but um, I think what, you know, when we're talking about resiliency at the neighborhood level, we continue to sort of say, this actually does really matter. And no, Boris won't be over to your house um, as soon as something goes wrong. Which is... Yes, exactly. So, so, so the idea, what Boris is saying is, you know, what lots of us will say, people do say, well, someone will, someone from the city will come if something goes wrong. Well, we're a pretty big city, so if something happens in this building, and it's only in this building, they'll all be here. The response will be terrific. 
If something happens and it is a wide swath across the city, um, chances are it's going to take time to get to you. And, uh, and we don't know what's coming. And we don't, we don't know what, we don't know when. So the smart thing is this. And, and, the, and it's the conversation we can have with our neighbors. We can always talk about the weather. And when we're talking about the weather, we can say, are you, are you prepared? Um, this was outreach that they developed, same thing, same messaging, um, you know, big posters that they could put up in, in their buildings, same thing, more stuff, images from 2013 that are very familiar to us all. Um, we, de we developed an emergency kit, uh, we had a little bit of money from social development at the city, and they helped us put this together, and we filled it with the basics, and I think, again, the most, to me, the most important thing is that radio, the flashlight, people didn't have flashlights in the power outage. People didn't have a flashlight. So you've got to have the flashlight, you've got to have the radio. Um, and, uh, and then for me, the other big deal again is that document folder which has your emergency plan in it with the copies of your important documents. Um, and these are three absolutely terrific <laughs> volunteers from um, Victoria Village. Um, Crew has developed an emergency app. Unfortunately, at this time, it's only good for the iPhone and a later model, the later OS uh, iPhone. You can get it at the um, at the App Store. Um, it's it does the same thing as these booklets. It has sort of helps you through um, systematically put together the kit and the plan. You can check off what you have, and send notes to yourself about what you need to to get. We're collaborating with York University, and that's thanks to Safe Rail for that introduction, um, to, put, to make this a web-based app so that anybody on any device can see it, and that'll be terrific when it happens. Ward 13 pilots. Um, we've been working to make a stakeholder network, and this is this idea of multi-sector collaboration around 100 High Park Avenue, which is another Toronto Community Housing Building, and we've worked with seniors there who are, would call themselves, I suspect, extreme weather volunteers. They've had all of the training, and, um, and, uh, and they certainly have uh, uh, conversations with their, their uh, neighbors about weather, things that they, you know, they just were simply unaware of. It's one more thing in a very busy life, but it's something that we need, these are the sorts of things we do need to be prepared for. So. Um, we do the, so we're trying to, as I say, create this sort of multi-sector uh, collaboration in a, in a 1.5K uh, area around, around 100 High Park. Faith in the Common Good is one of our partners and they work with faith groups and, faith, uh, uh, and have done some great pilot work in Toronto. They're asking um, City Council to um, um, enable uh, a mapping of, um, you know, a two kilometer sort of radius. These numbers come from, this is how far people are prepared to walk. People who are able to walk are prepared to walk or can walk. Two, two kilometers is max, 1.5 is maybe a little closer. But this is work that, that we'd like to see done. And I think Boris also has, you know, would, would like to see sort of similar, similar um, initiatives. This is the pilot uh, map that is now online. We've, we've had volunteers have been working on this for quite some time. Um, I was going to demonstrate it for you, but it means that I have to run over there, fiddle around with things, run back here. Um, so I'm not going to put it online now, but I am going to come around when people are in workshop mode and, and ask who would be interested in taking a look at it online and giving us some feedback. We need to hear, you know, how does it, how does it feel? But essentially, it will, it's, ward, it's the seven neighborhoods that make up Ward 13 with the sort of spillover into Ward 14. So it ends up being a sort of Ward 14 um, resource as well. Uh, it has the weather information that I've talked about along with the public health implications and, and weather projections. It has uh, floodplains and urban heat islands. These are, places where we need to be concerned about if it rains very heavily or if it gets very hot. Um, it'll tell you who lives in your neighborhood, uh, where you're, you know, it'll ask you questions about how long would it take me to, you know, to, to walk to my closest um, public uh, building where there, there, there might be air conditioning. Um, and sort of at the end of it all, um, 
it gives you a rating on, on the neighborhood. And, and you know, it's a little bit artificial because we're right downtown, we have great resources, we're pretty resilient generally, um, but we've, we're a big city. And I think once we start to do um, this work in other uh, wards, we'll see some real differences. And, um, and that's, that's all I'm going to say, um, but I am asking for help, and I think it's absolutely relevant in terms of the discussion around safe rail, because um, the more we know about preparedness and, uh, and, and making those neighborhood connections and strengthening communities, the better off we all are um, in any emergency situation. So please feel free to, uh, to speak to me about getting involved with this, and I have a little handout that will help you find the map online. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sheila. Um, that was great. Uh, now we're going to have uh, a little short presentation from uh, Safe Rail Communities. Um, Patricia will do a little um, presentation on uh, to sort of get us um, ready for the workshop piece that's coming up now. Um, so here we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Patricia Lai. I'm one of the co-founders of Safe Rail Communities. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organization, and we've been around since March 2014. We're a national initiative. Uh, we support rail communities like ours across Canada. And many people ask us what it is that we wish to achieve. And I think this slide sums it up quite nicely. This was taken on our street. We live uh, on a street that runs parallel to the main CP rail line that runs through our city. We want safe, transparent, and regulated rail. That's what we're asking for. So for neighborhoods like ours, and like the one we find ourselves in today, and like many others across Canada, the possibility of a rail accident or derailment is a reality. And while we advocate for and press government for safety-based standards with respect to the transport by rail of dangerous goods, we also need to prepare ourselves against a rail accident or derailment. So today's event was born out of a community response to a frightening rail accident that occurred in the west end of the city on August 21st of this year. And so to gauge the exact nature of people's concerns related to rail safety, we put out a survey in early September. Our survey is still open, uh, and to date we've had 97 responses. And most respondents uh, did identify as living within the GTA, from the junction to Summer Hill, from Long Branch to Maple, but we've also had responses from the Amgenog First Station in southwestern Ontario and even as far as Saskatchewan. These lines run across the country. So we'd like to share some uh, results uh, from this survey. So our first question asked everybody, or asks everyone, how much risk they feel there is for people living in a rail community. So almost four out of five respondents, so 79%, feel that there is significant or too much risk. 19% felt that there was some risk, and only 2% felt that there was little risk. No one felt that there was no risk. And when we asked people to name their top three concerns with regards to rail safety, dangerous goods stood out at 86%. The second most popular answer was train speed. And this response represented just over 9% of all responses. On April 28th of this year, Transport Minister Mark Garneau announced Protective Direction 36. As part of the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act, Protective Direction 36 requires that Class 1 railways like CP and CN annually disclose to the public via emergency planning officials aggregate historical data about the top 10 types and volumes of dangerous goods traveling through a municipality. And here is what was recently shared at Executive Committee of City Council. So in 2015, dangerous goods made up a little less than 10% of all goods transported by CP and CN. However, petroleum crude represents respectively 45% and 34% of all dangerous goods transported by these two Class 1 railways. So we have reason to be concerned. 
And when we asked if people knew of neighbors who would need assistance in the event of a rail accident or derailment, over 78% of respondents said that they did. All the more reason to have a plan to ensure that our neighborhoods are fully prepared. And we asked people whether or not they knew where the closest reception center to their homes is located. 91% said they did not. And what other gaps are there in our neighborhood plans? What do we need to know? The workshop portion of today's event will permit us to explore these questions and more. The workshop portion of our time today is about action. It's about working together to get ready for a rail accident or a disaster. Part of this workshop includes the very first launch of My Safe Rail app. This is a free web-based application that will enhance our ability to prepare against this type of neighborhood emergency. The app is part of a joint project between Dr. Ali Asghari of the Advanced Disaster Emergency and Rapid Response Simulations team at York University and Safe Rail Communities. This project is called Enhancing Community Preparedness for Rail Emergencies and is generously funded by the York Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies Global and Community Engagement Collaborative Project Fund. Thank you. Now to start the workshop portion, um, we'd like to invite um, Catherine Kenny. She is a, a, a student, a graduate student with the uh, York Disaster and Emergency Management Program, and um, she's been so supportive in helping us put this um, this workshop and event together. Um, we can't thank her enough. So 